Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. We are talking bodies today and why we are so darn uncomfortable in them. If you hear a lot of wind noise coming from outside, there's a horrible winter storm going on, but this is the only time I have to record, so here we go. As my patrons know, I'm working on another big video on the geopolitics of renewable energy, and I wanna make that a bit like my last video, which is more of an in-depth documentary style. But those take months to put together for somebody working full-time with chronic illness, so I thought now would be a great time to hop on and talk about something I've wanted to talk about for a while, body image, capital, the male gaze, and the spectacle. My body image journey and the horrible actions that I took as a result of very poor body image directly caused and exacerbated my chronic illness, and I've made an entire video on my chronic illness, so if you've seen that, this is going to be a, a deep dive into the main cause of that chronic illness and the dystopian society that gave it life. But first, as it is me, we're going to frame our discussion today by drawing on some really rad theorists, Fanon and Coulthart, who draw on Hegel and talk about the politics of recognition. So our journey starts with Yellow Knives Denny activist and scholar Glenn Coulthart, who wrote Red Skin, White Masks, which is a must read. Coulthart draws on Frantz Fanon, a psychoanalyst and decolonial theorist from the French colony of Martinique, who wrote Black Skin, White Masks and The Wretched of the Earth, both absolute must reads. And Fanon draws on and critiques Hegel, and I swear to God we're going to talk about body image today, just stay with me a little bit, I promise. In Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon critiques and adapts Hegel's understanding of intersubjective recognition. For Hegel and for many others, we don't form our understandings of ourselves or our subjectivities in isolation. Coming to understand ourselves and even becoming conscious of the self is a relational process. We become subjects in our own minds by recognizing and being recognized by other subjects as such. In short, the way we understand ourselves is heavily shaped by what we see mirrored back to us by others or by our society. Hegel insists that relations of recognition must be mutual for the realization of human freedom. And without going into the whole master-slave dialectic that Abigail from Philosophy Tube did a great video on, for Fanon and later Coulthard who were writing about colonial settings, in context of oppression or unequal power dynamics, recognition can never be mutual and therefore can never be emancipatory. Fanon also details the psychological violence of misrecognition, or of being recognized by society in ways that don't align with your understandings of self, in ways that are demeaning, dehumanizing, and dislocating. Taylor, who Coolheart goes on to critique but who he agrees with on misrecognition, says, A person or a group of people can suffer real damage, real distortion, if the people or society around them mirror back to them a confining or demeaning or contemptible picture of themselves. Non-recognition or misrecognition can inflict harm, can be a form of oppression, imprisoning one in a false, distorted, and reduced mode of being. For example, Fanon describes a really alienating encounter that he had on the streets of Paris where a little white girl gasped at the sight of him, told her mom that she was afraid of him, and called him the N-word. Fanon wrote that in that moment, the imposition of the child's racist gaze sealed him into a crushing objecthood, fixing him like a chemical solution is fixed by a dye, and he found himself temporarily accepting that he was the subject of the girl's call. Coulthart writes that the other's misrecognition here imprisoned Fanon in an externally determined and devalued conception of himself. Instead of being acknowledged as a man among men, he was reduced to an object among other objects. Fanon and Coulthart both argue that colonial configurations of power operate on an objective level and a subjective level. So there's an economic basis to the oppression, which is capitalism and its drive for land, resources, and labor. And then there's a subjective level to the oppression, which operates on people's hearts and minds and understandings of themselves. Fanon explains that over time, people can come to internalize these broader societal views of themselves and can actually seek out and identify with the terms of recognition dictated by the dominant or oppressive group or system. So in Fanon's example, for example, if the dominant white society views you as backwards, uneducated, dehumanized because of your skin tone and class position, first and foremost, but also because you purportedly haven't achieved 
X, Y, Z markers of success, you may find yourself wanting to seek out those markers of success. So maybe yourself becoming an educated capitalist and an oppressor of other people to prove to your horrible oppressors that you are worthy of their recognition. Fanon called this forming psychoaffective attachments to the terms of recognition dictated by your oppressor. But in seeking recognition on the oppressor's terms, you tacitly give legitimacy to those oppressor-sanctioned terms themselves, and so you almost inadvertently give legitimacy to their bigoted misrecognition of you in the first place. You lend credence to the idea that you only now deserve mutual positive recognition now that you've done what is expected of you on their terms. And even with more positive recognition, you ultimately will never be seen on the same level as the oppressor. You will always be objectified in some way. So you end up clamoring for a higher position within the hierarchy instead of smashing that hierarchy altogether. Glenn Coolhart uses this analytical framework and applies it to indigenous peoples in Canada, arguing that seeking recognition from the colonial state for cultural or even political rights is self-defeating. This is because you have to implicitly concede that the crown because yeah, Canada is still a constitutional monarchy, so there's that. But you have to implicitly concede that the crown actually has any legitimate authority to either bestow or disallow rights onto you when they are illegally occupying your land and just declaring that their law supersedes yours. So they both argue that a colonial structure of dominance rests on its ability to entice indigenous peoples to come to identify, either implicitly or explicitly, with the profoundly asymmetrical and non-reciprocal forms of recognition either imposed on or granted to them by the colonial state and society. And that seeking recognition on the oppressor's terms will never significantly modify or transcend the breadth of power at play in these unequal relationships. I also liken this to Audre Lorde's The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. Okay, so obviously the experiences of people living under European colonial and settler colonial rule have nothing at all in common with the experiences of a white settler woman on YouTube. We have had such vastly different experiences and social positions and just everything that there is really nothing to compare here at all. So you're probably wondering, why did I bring any of this up? And it is because although I have absolutely no interest in comparing uh, whatsoever our experiences, I think that the amazing theoretical tools and frameworks that these thinkers have developed, like recognition, like misrecognition, like being fixed by society's gaze, and most importantly, forming psychoaffective attachments to oppressive forms of recognition that only serve to further disenfranchise you, I think these are incredible and useful tools to analyze a number of different experiences under various oppressive systems, including cis-heteropatriarchy. And I would argue that patriarchy too has an objective and subjective element to it. There's the economic marginalization of women, non-men, and LGBTQ plus people. And there's also the subjective element that fixes us all in its confining gaze. And I would argue too that the patriarchal structure of dominance continues to reproduce itself in part by enticing women and men as well to come to identify either implicitly or explicitly with asymmetrical forms of recognition that just further serve to disenfranchise us. Because I'm talking about the cis-hetero male gaze today and because I'm largely coming from my own experience, I'll be talking mainly about how this gaze harms women. And I include trans women in this, of course, who often face even more pressure to adopt certain markers of womanhood in order to be worthy of recognition. I also acknowledge that the patriarchal male gaze can be painfully dislocating for men as well. And we are all fixed to some degree by this confining gaze, which at its heart is misogynist. Um, to all my envies out there, I see you doing the Lord's work and just bucking these categories completely. So this you know, discussion might not apply to you, but who knows, you might find yourself resonating with some things in my experience as well, and you can let me know. So I don't want to spend a ton of time today explaining what the male gaze is. I kind of want to assume that you're here with me. I'll give a very brief description, but myself, Nicole, and Catherine have actually done a two-hour stream all about this topic. Yes, it is two hours, but you can put it on in the background. Uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback on it, so that will explain things a lot better than I will do here. 
But very briefly, the concept of the male gaze was introduced by scholar and filmmaker Laura Mulvey in her now famous 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. It describes how our media assumes a cishet male as the neutral audience observer, and everything we see is from a deeply objectifying hetero male viewpoint where women are visually positioned as objects of male desire. So men are empowered as the agents and women as the visual spectacle or objects, and it's often not what is being shown necessarily, but also how it is being shown. So how women's bodies are being framed by the camera angles, by the lighting, by the music, etc. The male gaze isn't just natural either, it's a social construct that is deeply sexist, racist, and colorist, ableist, fat phobic, all the rest. And it's not just confined to our media either, it's in like all public spaces, sporting events, bars, <laughs> restaurants, you name it. So again, this was very brief, but you can check out all our streams for more. I'm gonna just assume that people understand what I mean when I say the male gaze. And I wanna actually just read this series of posts that I saw on social media because I think it really encapsulates well the effects of a lifetime of being trained to internalize this gaze. Women aren't embracing their sexualities, they're embracing being sexualized. They're internalizing categories made by men and deriving pleasure from the thought of giving men pleasure and of being attractive in the third person, and convincing themselves that this is the same thing as genuinely feeling sexual pleasure and agency. Women are being taught to derive sexual pleasure from being found attractive or appealing in some way, whether by how they dress or what sex acts they perform for men. They are being encouraged not to think about what sex acts they find most pleasurable or what about male bodies they like best, but to value how men value them sexually. Here is an aspect of pseudo-female power. They are the only ones capable of driving this man crazy with one. They are the only ones capable of handling this man with all his intensity. They are the only ones capable of sating his lust. And they are the only ones capable of driving men to their knees. Women are being groomed not to desire, but to eroticize being desired. We talk a lot on this sex stream channel about how this can show up in your sex life when you internalize these things. It can lead to really unhealthy and traumatic sexual experiences. It can lead to being dissociated from your body and kind of seeing yourself in third person. It can lead to the orgasm gap in cis-hetero relationships. It can perpetuate the idea that sex is something that happens to women or that's something that women do for men, but not a mutual embodied experience where both members are meant to have sexual satisfaction. Today we're going to talk about how internalizing this gaze can also show up in terms of eating disorders and anxious attachment styles and just other forms of self-harm. So let's talk about how baby Mexi felt completely misrecognized by society and how she formed very dangerous psycho-affective attachments to very horrifying terms of recognition that destroyed her health and her mental health. I think a very big contributing factor to me feeling so misrecognized by society was that I was a chubbier girl growing up. And I know that it is difficult for people of any genders to be in a bigger body, especially when you're growing up, you know, kids are never kind. But I feel like especially as young girls and young women, we learn from a very young age that our appearance is our primary value. And it also often feels like our bodies belong to the public more than they belong to ourselves, where people feel very comfortable commenting on our bodies and our appearances all the time, whether that be good or bad. It, it's not always negative, right? But like the majority of compliments that you get as a young girl growing up have to do with your body or your hair or your clothes or just anything to do with your general attractiveness or your appearance. You know, we tell boys that they are strong and capable and we tell young girls that, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so cute, you're so sweet. So it was really jarring being a little kid and I just imagine, you know, all the little kids being these just, you know, wide-eyed, loving beings who are out in the world trying to, you know, meet and connect with other loving beings. And you know, being that that little wide-eyed loving being and not knowing that there was anything wrong with my body or not having any reason to believe that there was something inherently wrong with my body and that that should be any kind of impediment to me forming connections with other people and just slowly coming to that realization by seeing that mirrored back to me from basically everyone around me, right? Like adults, teachers, doctors, other kids, uh, the media, etc and coming to learn that I indeed was wrong. <laughs> My body was wrong. I was failing to be what I was supposed to be and that I needed to change if I wanted to be valued and liked and loved, especially romantically, 
Um, so yeah, to just get that kind of positive mutual recognition. So it's like a little wide-eyed loving being going up there and trying to connect with people and then just getting mirrored back disgust or mockery or whatnot. And I wasn't even in that big of a body, to be honest. I mean, there were people who had it worse. I mean, there's people in my classes that definitely had it worse than I did. Um, but my body was unconventional enough in that it wasn't just perfectly thin that I would get a number of comments on it. And I watched and learned from women in my family about how they thought of their own bodies. And they were always very self-deprecating about their own bodies and felt like they were not good enough because of their bodies. And sometimes they even wouldn't go out to things or wouldn't want to go out to things. Like if their friends had invited them to something, they wouldn't want to go uh, because they wouldn't want their friends to quote unquote, see them like that. So that obviously makes an impression. And I remember actually at a very young age, my mom telling me that I was too fat and that I needed to lose weight and just like burning up inside because I was like, well, you're feeding me first of all. Um, but also, uh, yeah, I was, it was a lot. Um, and we actually went on so many diets together when I was a teenager. We went on Weight Watchers, Atkins. Um, there was this cabbage soup diet. Basically you would eat nothing but cabbage boiled in water for several days. And then you would start slowly introducing other food. I mean, the soup itself was fine. It wasn't a bad, like it was a fine soup, but it was literally just cabbage boiled in water with a few spices. And I remember we went like three or four days eating this cabbage water. And on like the fourth evening, you were allowed to eat one baked potato with no dressing on it with your <laughs> cabbage water. And we were just ravenous for that potato. We devoured that potato and it felt so small. And I remember like after it being done, we just ate it so quickly and we were just standing in the kitchen, just looking at each other like. And again, I don't like blame her for any of that. I mean, she spent a lot of time uh, dealing with a lot of shitty comments on her appearance and she's an absolutely beautiful woman inside and out, but she was obviously just trying to like help me and spare me that pain. <laughs> uh, but you know, not quite realizing that like hearing it from her and like internalizing this diet culture was traumatizing for me in its own right. So these diets were never sustainable. They never worked. And then we would always feel so much worse about ourselves because then it was like, well, we had tried and failed. And there's absolutely a, a real like capitalist hustle culture mentality that goes into this, especially nowadays, it seems. It seems like our bodies are just meant to be these shrines to our individual work ethic. And anyone in a bigger body is just assumed to be lazy, whether that's remotely true or not. And in this faux meritocracy, anyone assumed to be lazy is just assumed to not be worthy of anything like respect, material security, nothing. Anyway, I feel like somehow despite all of this in my preteen and teen years, I still held on to this kind of rebellious energy. I hadn't quite let my entire sense of self be stamped out quite yet. Like I was still angry. I still felt like it was unjust the way that society misrecognized a whole bunch of different people for different reasons. And I did a number of things purposely to kind of push back on what I felt was this objectifying, confining gaze. Like I dyed my hair really wild colors at a young age. Uh, I would wear really like baggy clothes and you know, like band t-shirts and things like that. Cause I was just pushing back on this idea that I needed to sexualize myself in order to be valued or liked by people. Um, sometimes I would wear pajamas to school and whatever. I just had this really firm line that I wasn't going to cave into this weird, like objectifying pressure. And um, I had the idea that, you know, if I just showed up in my most kind of like unappealing self, then that way I would be sure that the people who did like me, um, especially the people who wanted to date me were doing so because they saw me for the being that I am and that they truly did like and care and maybe even love who I was and not who I was expected to be. But it's made me think a lot about the cool girl trope and and about how like I had all of the markers of the cool girl except for being attractive to the male gaze. And as it turns out, that is the only thing that you need to actually fit into that trope. None of the rest of it matters. Your personality, your intellect, your humor, your athleticism, unless you are meeting the standards, like those objectifying societal standards. And we'll get into my eating disorder in 
a, a minute, but you know, once I actually broke and just forced my body into quote unquote, what it was supposed to be, only then was it huge that I was intelligent because wow, how rare is it to be intelligent and beautiful? How rare is it to be funny and beautiful? Um, this is obviously sarcasm. These are misogynist comments that I would get all of the time. But yeah, I mean, it felt like society really didn't care who I was until I was fulfilling my role as a woman and adhering to the terms of recognition set by the patriarchal gaze. And then suddenly, you know, okay, now the rest of my personality can matter. But my eating disorder started when I was about 18 or 19 years old. And I had been in a very codependent relationship for several years before that. And I actually think that this patriarchal society and this gaze socializes women to have more anxious attachment styles, but that's beyond the scope of this video. But anyway, uh, this guy had made comments about my body uh, not being good enough, which like, you know, he had apparently loved for the past couple years. So whatever. But you know, these comments <laughs> just really got to me. And I think I think at that point, just kind of a lifetime of that kind of internalized shit just got to me and something just snapped. I just honestly like broke at that point. And that was the start of my 10 year plus eating disorder. And I was able to convince myself that I didn't have an eating disorder because it was more like orthorexia, just like very obsessive, healthy eating combined with excessive working out. And I go into more detail in the chronic illness video, but yeah, I just thought, you know, there's there's no problem. I'm just really healthy and just really into working out. And I've realized that my autism actually contributed very negatively to my ED. Uh, girls with autism are apparently more prone to EDs and the way that my brain functions and the way that I can fixate on things really took things to another level. Here's one example of how I was praised this entire time, which we'll come back to, but I was praised a lot. Like people would say, wow, you know, you have such amazing willpower. You don't ever eat any sweets. You're so disciplined. You're so committed. You're so this, that, you know, just how do you do it? How do you have the willpower? And I honestly never even really understood the question because I never framed it in terms of willpower or not willpower. I was like, well, I've made a decision around the outcome that I want to achieve. I know the steps that I'll need to take to achieve said outcome in the least amount of time possible. And so given that, why would I ever do anything that was contrary to my desired outcome? Like that would just be illogical. <laughs> so there's no willpower about it. Like the decision has been made and so that's the decision. So obviously in other aspects of my life, these traits have served me well, but in this and perhaps others, not so much. But the major issue was that all of a sudden, all of the positive recognition that I had been craving since infancy just came absolutely flooding in. It was so abundant. And of course, now I'm able to realize that getting positive recognition around how you look, especially in comparison to this highly sexist objectifying gaze is not positive or self-affirming at all. And it actually locks you in a system of recognition that is based on your own oppression. And meeting these terms of recognition doesn't actually lead to self-actualization, especially because they are always necessarily temporary and fleeting. Like we are all aging and the gaze is pedophilic in nature, which we're doing another stream on, but meeting those terms will always be temporary. And then when you start to age and you start to lose some of the privilege and the empowerment that you thought that you had under these terms of recognition, you can feel that really violently. And I think that's why we see so many older women now. I mean, even young women, I mean, I'm going to talk about, you know, plastic surgery and tweakment soon, but you know, you see this kind of desire to hold on to that value because it's been so instilled that this is the only value that you have. And also society treats older women like shit. I mean, they really, you know, 
women who are considered unattractive to the male gaze as they age, like, yeah, you get treated like fucking shit. And I think from that vantage point, you can realize that this is an oppressive hierarchical system and that getting recognition within that hierarchy is always going to be ultimately self-defeating. You're always going to be giving legitimacy and credence to a system of valuation that ultimately objectifies you. And being objectified is not the same as being truly desired. And it also sells out everyone who is considered to be below you on the hierarchy. But at the time it feels like empowerment, right? It feels like, you know, you're posting those selfies, you're getting all the attention, all the praise, all the supposed admiration, you're maybe getting money. Uh, society is telling you, you're doing good, you're impressive, you're disciplined, you're committed. You are somebody that people want to emulate. You are somebody that people want to be friends with now. More and more people want to be your friend now. More and more men want to date you now. More and more people actually want to listen to what you have to say now and seemingly take you more seriously, even though a lot of them don't. <laughs> I mean, I get comments all the time about how some people watch my videos with the sound off so they can just look at me but not hear me. Isn't that, isn't that sweet? Isn't that such a delightful thing to, to tell a person? But you know, we aren't just conditioned by images and discourses that we see in the media. We are conditioned day by day by how other people react to us. We are all upholding these oppressive systems. We are all confining each other with our oppressive gazes because we've internalized this shit. Like the amount of praise I got for the extremely long-term physical and psychological damage that I was doing to myself is actually really messed up when you think about it. Like it's really fucked up. And partly because of this, I feel like I really did internalize the capitalist hustle culture mentality when it came to bodies. I remember sitting in first or second year university and one of my professors was just really complaining about the unrealistic expectations placed on women's bodies, how everyone's supposed to be like a size zero, or I guess now you're supposed to have huge tits, a huge ass and a tiny waist. And I remember actually thinking like, you just don't want it bad enough. <laughs> like all you got to do is get up at 5.30 in the morning, every morning, work out two hours before work, and then just chew wads and wads of sugar-free gum and drink energy drinks all day to suppress your voracious appetite. Ignore your migraines, ignore your insomnia, ignore the concerning changes to your menstrual cycle. And that's it. That's really it. I apologize for the dark joke, perhaps. I do use humor to talk about all of this, partly because it is actually hilarious how fucked up this is and how I don't actually think that my experience is an anomaly. I think that it's uh, far more common than not. But lest you hear that and think, hey, great tips, Maxie, I'm gonna go, gonna go get on that right now, watch my chronic illness video because I did develop a chronic migraine condition, uh, insomnia, and very bad issues with my endocrine system and ultimately an autoimmune condition with my thyroid. So don't recommend. As you can imagine, developing a thyroid condition meant that I could no longer control my weight, which you can probably imagine was quite devastating for somebody with body dysmorphia. I put on about 15 pounds in one month, in the very first month, and obviously that was a lot for me to deal with. I actually, you know, before I understood my condition, I actually saw that and then decided to eat less and work out more, which when you have issues with your endocrine system and your thyroid in particular, doing that is so counter, I mean, it's always counterproductive. Don't, I mean, diet culture is bullshit. Do not, do not get into this mess. But yeah, you know, it, it, my body would just downregulate its metabolism even more because it was in serious survival mode. And you can imagine that years and years and years of this was very devastating on the functioning and health of my body. In hindsight, developing this thyroid problem helped me to move past the worst parts of my body dysmorphia because when you, when you realize that you can no longer control your weight at all, um, you know, it just, the punishment that you were putting yourself through no longer seems rational. And since I was just, you know, taking a very fixated and logical and calculating approach to this, you know, once it was no longer rational, it was like, all right, well, I guess I have to 
come to accept myself, don't I? But honestly, I will have body dysmorphia for the rest of my life. And it's not just about my weight. It's about so many other things, uh, so many other features, and now aging. So let's get into the section on plastic surgery, tweakments, and just the increasing trends of these things in our society. I want to shout out Kim Foster, aka for Harriet, who was really open and honest about why she got Botox while being someone who is heavily critical of the male gaze, the patriarchy, and the capitalist beauty industry, so go check out her video on this. It's like the, oh, you hate capitalism and yet you participate in it curious meme. Like, in a society that has broken you down and just left you with debilitating body dysmorphia, in a society oriented around the male gaze, which is downright pedophilic and really fetishizes youth and treats women over 30 as if there's just no reason to go on living. In a society where social media dominates everything and it is highly spectacularized. I mean, even people who have gotten a lot of work done are still putting out absurdly edited photos of themselves. It is unsurprising to me that tweakments and plastic surgery are on the rise, especially among young people. I told the story in the male gay stream, but uh, as someone with body dysmorphia on the internet, as a woman on the internet who just gets a ton of comments, I mean, it's a bit better now, but I used to get a lot of comments on my body, uh, whether good or bad. And I had somebody commenting on my nose a number of times to the point that it just got really inside of my head. I could not look in a mirror without just fixating on my nose and thinking that it looked too big. I would run my face through these face apps that would shrink your nose and I'd be like, oh my God, I would look so much better if I had a small nose. I actually looked up what the cost of rhinoplasty would be. Cause I was like, oh, I'll just get like a tiny, a tiny tweak that nobody will notice except me. <laughs> of course it was about $8,000. So I was like, okay, that dream is dead. But I actually just find it so wild how uniform all of our faces are supposed to be. Like we're all supposed to have the little tiny little upturned nose. We're all supposed to have the big lips. We're all supposed to have the just defined cheekbones. And it's increasingly difficult to find actors, singers, any, any woman in the public eye. It's just increasingly difficult to find someone who hasn't done all of these things, at least gotten a nose job, right? And it's, I really mean no like shade or disrespect to anyone who has gotten these things done. Obviously the draw of these things is very real. I just think we really do need to talk about the psychologically and potentially physically damaging trends that are being dictated to us by this really sick society. I mean, how classist it is. And in the male gay stream again, I was talking about the movie, The House of Gucci and just how floored I was to see a leading lady who actually had a nose. I was blown away by that. And how excited I was for that was just really um, said something about how surreal our reality has become. And here I'd like to inject just a teensy bit more theory and bring up Debord's Society of the Spectacle. In Society of the Spectacle, Debord described how capitalism inundates us with a barrage of signs and images through advertising, television, film, celebrity, etc., and how these signs and images become what mediate our understandings of and interactions with the world around us. The spectacle is capitalism's instrument for distracting and pacifying the masses, turning us all into passive consumers and encouraging us to focus on appearances and build and define our own identities based on how we wish to appear to others. He writes, the spectacle is not a collection of images, but a social relation among people mediated by images. These images manufacture new desires and keep us in a perpetual state of lack and wanting, which we can temporarily ease by purchasing commodities, but soon we'll be back in that state of dislocation and malaise and really just overwhelm, like sensory overwhelm. And it really has me thinking about how we live in such a patriarchal capitalist dystopia where people actually prefer the spectacle to real life. I think it was Kim Kardashian who said this, don't quote me on this, but I, I think it was her, or someone from the Kardashian family, who was defending their use of Facetune and saying that people don't actually really want to see the real you. Given the choice, they would rather see the highly edited, surreal, aspirational vision of you rather than your actual face. And it made me really sad because I have to say that they might be right. 
On the interwebs today, you can find so many videos, so many Instagram accounts that really break down all of the different plastic surgeries that basically everyone in the public eye has had, but mostly women. And the intention of these videos is to tell people that you don't need to feel terrible, you know, please don't feel terrible sitting at home looking and comparing yourself to these people. You likely do not have the thousands and thousands of dollars that it would take to reconstruct your face or your body to make it look the way that you think it's supposed to look. So while the depression and suicide rate of young preteen and teen girls has been on the rise, really skyrocketing thanks to this exposure to this dystopia, there are a lot of people out there who are doing damage control and are trying to tell young women like, it's okay, it's okay to have a nose, it's okay to have pores, it's okay to have thin lips, it's okay to not have gotten a BBL. And all I can think is like, it almost doesn't even matter. Like it does not matter. Knowing that the women who are most held up and celebrated for their beauty have mostly reconstructed or enhanced their faces in some way is not going to lessen people's mental anguish or body dysmorphia because we look around and see that we live in a society that cares more about the spectacle than real life, that wants the spectacle over real life. The world knows, like the world knows that the people and mostly the women who are held up as the icons and pinnacles of beauty were not born that way. They purchased that and they also highly edit their photos and still no one cares. Like th these are still the women who are rewarded for being beautiful <laughs> in terms of this objectifying male gaze. They are still the ones rewarded with all of the money, all of the fame, all of the attention, you know, all of the things that people tell you are the markers of empowerment. I mean, you can argue that these things are actually curses and that true empowerment needs to be internal and not based on external validation. And it needs to be communal and not individual, but still, right? Like these are still the people who are the most rewarded for meeting the, the terms of recognition, these hor horribly oppressive and hierarchical and objectifying terms of recognition, right? Like there is a material reward for doing that. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's not real. But I wanted to talk a bit about my own Botox story and talk a bit about choice feminism. So I got Botox several years ago. And uh, I think I had, you know, managed to move on from the body dysmorphia that I had of my body, maybe even my nose. Uh, and I moved on to my crow's feet and just how horrible it was that I was aging because gross. And uh, I was in an esthetician's clinic's office because I would go there to get laser facials, which themselves are very invasive. I mean, if you had seen me after getting one of these <laughs> laser facials or micro needling, I guess the laser facials, well, some of them were very invasive. Like, I mean, my face would just be like beet red after the micro needling, there's blood, there's blood on your face. So it is very intense and that is also kind of anti-aging stuff. But anyway, I was asking, you know, uh, was this gonna help like around my eyes? And they said no, because it's so intense that you can't do it around your sensitive eye area. So they offered me some deal on Botox and uh, I was like, oh God, no, like that sounds too intense and invasive and whatever. And they were like, no, it only lasts for three months. So if you don't like it, then it'll wear off. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went for it. I was devastated. Uh, I guess I must have gotten too much or something, but I just felt like I could not emote at all from my eyes. Um, I actually, I filmed a video at that time and I remember just being like, I cannot post this. I won't tell you which video it was, <laughs> but I was like, I can't post this. Like people are going to notice. Um, and for the most part, people didn't say anything, but I did have one person who commented saying that it looked like I had botulism in my face. And I was like, but I was also really worried about what my partner would think because we had not been dating for that long, but I was absolutely head over heels for him. And he is a comrade. He's an anti-capitalist, a proletarian feminist, just fantastic politics. And I thought that he was just going to think I was so vain and ridiculous and insecure. And that's not, you know, what I wanted to project. Um, Cause I feel like sometimes I come across, like I have this real air of confidence and in some ways I do, but in other 
other ways I'm just like really broken inside. So anyway, I, I was really concerned because we were, um, we would always like look into each other's eyes and just smile and whatever. And I was getting really anxious thinking that we were looking into each other's eyes and, you know, he was projecting this like loving look into my eyes. And I thought that he must just be looking at me and just getting these like dead cold disgusting eyes and I was just like oh my god like he's not gonna be able to know he's not gonna be able to tell that I love him and like I was, I was really upset about it so eventually I just I was like okay I have to tell him so I did and he was like oh yeah I didn't notice and I was like cool 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 so I swore at that point that I would never get it again and then of course like three months later I was in the mirror being like ugh look at my face. I look terrible. And I think that for people now knowing that, I mean, people 10 years my junior are getting this stuff. People in their early 20s are getting preventative Botox for their wrinkles, right? And I think in that environment, there can also be this anxiety that like, well, well, if I don't get it too, then I'm really going to stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> like I'm really going to look like I'm, I'm aging terribly. Right. Um, so it just creates this whole new level of ridiculous pressure, this whole new level of, you know, the terms of recognition that you're supposed to be meeting. So I wanted to talk a bit about choice feminism and this idea that anything that women do should just be completely off the table for any kind of critical discussion. Um, and also this idea that if you're going to do something, you should make sure that you're doing it for you. First of all, I am not a fan of choice feminism. It is very liberal, very individualist. Uh, I don't support everything that women choose to do, and it is certainly not always feminist. It might also be harmful and even self-harming. Hillary Clinton chose to back every disastrous U.S. imperialist intervention and bomb innocent children for profit. I don't support those choices, and her furthering capitalist patriarchy as a woman does not make it feminist. And I think more and more people understand this now and are coming to a more systemic understanding and critique of patriarchy and capitalism and things like that. I see this idea of girl boss feminism being really roundly critiqued in even, you know, mainstream liberal spaces. And I've seen a number of people talking about how plastic surgery is absolutely not feminist just because women are doing it. We need to think about the context within which choices are being made and we also need to think about is it really a choice like if everyone around you is doing a thing leaving you to be ostracized and treated more poorly or even misrecognized by society if you don't do it is it really a choice I don't know like something as simple as wearing makeup to work for example if you are going to be told that you are being unprofessional if you don't do it if you're going to be continually passed up for promotions because you're not playing the game you're not adhering to the the standard dress code or whatever you know is it really a choice so what does doing it for you mean in the context of socialization under patriarchy and capitalism what does it mean in the context of recognition being relational like I talked about. Like myself, I was born into this world as an animal, as a primate who evolved to live in my ecosystem, certainly not in late stage capitalism, but you know what I mean. I honestly can't imagine wanting to go get Botox outside of growing up in the extremely sick misogynist society that I grew up in. Like outside of that society, I really can't imagine waking up in my early 30s and thinking, hey, you know what I'm going to do just for me? Just for me, I'm going to seek out a clinician, not because I'm ill or have anything wrong with me, but I'm going to find a, a, a clinician to get a bunch of needles and inject them, eject a neurotoxin, eject a neurotoxin in and around my sensitive eye area and into my brain. Uh, just for me, that's, that's just, that's just for me. That's just something that I really want to do. I can't think of a single external influence that would have made me make this decision. Again, clearly this is not about shaming anyone or myself. I mean, I just, I can find humor in it. And I think that honestly, if we're not able to have really real, honest conversations with each other about this kind of stuff, then we're just going to be out there perpetuating these toxic systems and remaining in their control instead of uniting to smash them. So I hear this idea often like, do it if it'll make you more confident. And I'm like, okay, but why would I feel more confident 
doing these things. Like you got to add the why there. I would feel more confident doing these things. Or even when I had my eating disorder, like I felt more confident doing those things because I knew that when I walked around, I would then be recognized by everyone around me as somebody who was meeting or exceeding the expectations of me under patriarchy and capital. Because I judged the way that I look based on the societal standard. Like, yeah, I'm not doing these things for men specifically. Like I see people talk about the internalized male gaze and use the, um, the metaphor by Margaret Atwood about having a man in your head. And it's not like you actually have a man in your head. And I actually, you know, the men in your head or the men in your life might actually be telling you that you look great. Like my partner tells me all the time that he thinks I'm so sexy and all that stuff. And I, I never, ever, ever tire of hearing that. But when I look in the mirror, it's not his voice in my head. Like I'm judging myself by the societal gaze, the societal male gaze. So even when I do things that are for me and not for him, it's never just for me. It's, it's impossible for it to just be for me. I hope that's coming across. And I think if collectively we can start admitting that to ourselves, then we can start moving towards dismantling the power that these systems have over us. And again, working to smash them for everyone. I think unfortunately too many of us and myself included have been too busy clambering for a better position within this oppressive hierarchy which at the end of the day objectifies us all and can never be liberating. As Audre Lorde masterfully put it, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I've really been engaged in this lifelong project of reclaiming the gaze. What is my gaze? How can I be an agent and a subject in my own story and not an object to be looked at by others? Coldheart and Fanon talk about the importance of self-recognition and that we become self-actualized and ready for revolutionary action when we are able to completely rid ourselves from these psycho-effective attachments to oppressive systems. And of course, there needs to be a material aspect to all this. We do need to overthrow this capitalist system that perpetuates all of this for profit. I mean, all of this is done so that we will buy more goods and just be constantly consuming and constantly dissatisfied with ourselves. But on the subjective front, you know, it is really hard to rid ourselves of these psychoaffective attachments because it's, it's how we've come to learn to understand and value ourselves. I'm not gonna say that I have answers other than I'm just constantly doing meditation work, energy work, therapy work, to stop seeking external validation, least of all on my body or my appearance, which I know and I keep telling myself is the least interesting thing about me. My body, my face, my hair, my skin, like these are the least interesting things about me. And I want to be recognized for the being that I am. I, I don't actually want to be recognized for my appearance. And I really actually mean that, like other than like, I want my partner, if, if my partner stopped complimenting my appearance, like every two seconds, I would just be like, what is going on here? Um, but I feel like outside of that, I, I just honestly, I don't want even compliments on my appearance because I feel like that locks you in the system. It locks you in this idea of believing that your appearance is anything that you should be seeking validation or, or getting validation for, right? It just, it's locks you in this oppressive system. So I actually have gotten to the point where I'm like, I just don't want, I mean, it's not even relevant, especially when I'm on YouTube and I'm talking about politics, it's not relevant, like how I look at all. It's just not. So I don't have hard answers. It is a constant struggle, but I will say that it is also made more difficult by leftist men who also perpetuate these systems. Um, and I would say even like, yeah, listening to somebody talk about politics and then commenting on their body, like that's a way of perpetuating these systems, right? Giving more time and attention to women uh, who, you know, more closely approximate this male gaze or who are performing for the male gaze and not listening to women who you don't find attractive, right? Um, I actually have a really gross story <laughs> about photos of mine that were put up on a subreddit, but I already told it in the male gaze stream, so I won't tell it here again. But my point here is that 
you know, it's not just for um, the people who are, I guess, most, <laughs> I'm not going to say most victimized because, you know, I, I think everyone under this patriarchal gaze is, is victimized. And obviously, like I said, trans women are, um, I think, dealing with so much more um, than I have dealt with in my life in terms of misrecognition and being, you know, fixed by the objectifying gaze. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it is important for all of us who have been damaged by this to do the work on reclaiming the gaze um, and stop acquiescing and work to kind of smash these systems. Um, but it's also important for everyone of all genders to examine how they are potentially uh, perpetuating and upholding these oppressive systems. Um, I firmly believe that men need to deeply divest from the male gaze uh, just completely. And that's going to take a lot of work as well, because that's been internalized in a number of different ways. Um, but ultimately, this doesn't serve anyone. And I hope that we can unite and work to smash these systems, uh, both materially and subjectively, for the true liberation of all. Thanks to my incredible patrons for making my videos possible. To support the show and join the Discord, head to patreon.com slash mexi, or you can give me a one-time tip or donation. The link is in the description box below.